Imagine that you're living through the establishment of a 1970s Latin American dictatorship. You're reading the news day to day and watching things as they gradually develop. You hear about the initial coup or transfer of power if you prefer a different term. There's lots of discussion on the previous government and debates about whether they really deserve to be deposed, but not too much talk about what the future actually holds as a result. Soon some shady news starts coming out of the country. The new government is cracking down on protests, going after opponents and making concerning speeches. They have their excuses though. They say they're simply taking measures to secure their proud country against traitors, subversives and terrorists. Nothing wrong with that, right? Well, as we found out not long after, in Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Bolivia, the list goes on, there was a whole lot wrong with that. And those who defended it all, who accepted the narrative of the dictatorships, who tried to divert attention away from them by talking endlessly about the governments that they deposed, were complicit. They also came out looking really, really dumb, which might be something that matters more to some people, I don't know. But hey, there's actually no need for you to imagine this scenario because you're living through it right now. That early stage with all the bad news full of red flags coming through daily is where we're at right now in Bolivia. You're witnessing the establishment of a 70s style dictatorship in real time. Will you be one of its defenders and enablers? Or will you heed the clear warning signs that we by now know all too well and speak out against it? I'm going to chronologically lay out just what the supposedly interim government of Janine Añez Chavez has done since taking power on the 12th of November 2009. Sadly, a lot of this news has slipped under the radar of the English language press, and it really just hasn't been given the coverage and the attention that it deserves, because everyone's still just talking about Eva Morales. So look, except when the news directly concerns him, I'm going to set him aside for this video. Debate over his regime and what happened in the elections, simply distracts from much, much more pressing concerns about the present government, which is right now, in this very moment, being flagrantly murderous and authoritarian. Anyone who truly cares about democracy, even a little bit, should be more than willing to recognize this and come out against them. Let's get started. <laughs> To introduce the new government, here's a short video clip. See that woman there? She's the president of Bolivia right now. Also present are ministers and other officials from her government, along with military commanders. It was filmed in early December in the government palace. So that was an evangelical Christian sermon held in the government palace with government ministers and the president in attendance and clearly quite involved in the proceedings, in which it is proclaimed that the constitutionally secular state of Bolivia is not just governed by God, but also owned by God. So how did we get to this in less than two months? Well, here's what this government has done in chronological order. October 20th, 2019. The Bolivian general election is held. Evo Morales wins in the first round amid allegations of irregularities and fraud. There's protests against the result that go on for weeks afterwards. November 10th, Morales announces new elections. Hours later, the military stepped in and asked him to resign, which he did. November 11th, in various different places around the country, the military opened fire on pro-Morales protesters, killing at least four. November 12th, it turns out that the military had also asked the next three people in the line of succession to resign as well. Coincidentally, all of these other potential replacements for the presidency 
were members of Morales' mass party. The fourth in line was Senator Janine Añez Chavez, a staunch opponent of the mass party whose party had only received 4% of the vote in the recent election. She declares herself as president in a very, very normal way, before an empty Senate. She is then inaugurated completely against tradition by the military themselves with a grand parade. Añez has a history of open racism. The AFP fact-checking organization has confirmed that free racist tweets that she made against Aymara indigenous peoples are authentic. But hey, it's supposed to just be a transitional government, with a mandate to just organize new elections as soon as possible and ensure the daily functioning of government bureaucracy. Añez might be unelected and it might be a bit fishy that everyone in front of her just happened to resign, but since her only real job is to ensure that she's replaced by an elected president as soon as possible, everything should be smooth and simple anyway. Well, she's gonna do a lot more than that actually. She's gonna take drastic authoritarian actions and her government will constantly threaten anyone who opposes them as if they actually have a mandate to do whatever they want. That night, she enters the government palace carrying a massive Bible, yelling that the Bible has returned to the government palace. This is a reference to the fact that the previous government had passed a new constitution that declared Bolivia as a secular state, something that Añez seems to want to change. November 13th. With more fanfare than most actually democratically elected governments, Añez begins appointing a large ministry, filled to the brim with opponents of Evo Morales, begging the question of why an interim government needs such a large team in the first place. The new interior minister, Arturo Murillo, issued a threat to political opponents mere minutes after taking his post, warning that so-called traitors should start to flee. Oh, she also replaced the entire military high command. Not a very normal thing for a government that's just supposed to organize elections to do. Democrat democratically elected deputies tried to enter Congress to hold the day's scheduled session, but were prevented from doing so by police stationed outside by the new government. November 14th. This was an eventful day. The interim government started making important foreign policy decisions that are very much not within the realm of things that interim governments do. For example, it entirely cut diplomatic ties with Venezuela and expelled all of its diplomatic personnel. The newly appointed interior minister also announced the arrest of four Cuban medical personnel. According to him, these four Cubans who had been working in hospitals in the country were part of the cause of the massive protests against the new government. Now, you know, there could be simpler and more logical explanations, like maybe the 45% plus of the population that had just voted for the previous president was simply angry that he had resigned and was replaced with an opponent. But no, the interim government went straight to fomenting conspiracy theories. Apparently, the only possible explanation is that insidious foreigners are bending the minds of the protesters. As they get increasingly desperate for excuses, this becomes an almost daily habit of theirs. In response, the Cuban government evacuates 720 diplomats and medical workers, and Añez breaks diplomatic relations with Cuba. So, within its first three days in government, this transitional government had already made drastic shifts in foreign policy, by cutting diplomatic relations entirely with two countries. On the same day, they passed a decree, a law straight from the president, something that is, again, generally the realm of presidents who were actually elected. This decree legalizes the deployment of the military against protesters, something that the military themselves had said that they would refuse to do under the previous government, yet now they were suddenly happy to go along with it. But worse than that, the same decree also granted the military and the police immunity from criminal responsibility for any actions taken against protesters. Laws regarding the acceptable use of force in these situations are already in place, so there would be no need to pass such a decree unless it's intended to go beyond those. The Inter-American Human Rights Commission agreed, tweeting that the grave decree in Bolivia ignores international human rights laws and stimulates violent repression. That night, the new Minister of Communications, Roxana Lizarraga, accused journalists of being traitors for reporting on events that were unfolding in the country. She also warned that they will be made to respond before the law and said that she already had lists of these journalists. The government supporters took these words to heart. They quickly began threatening and attacking journalists. It got so bad, so fast, that a group of Argentine journalists and camera crews from a diverse array of TV networks 
networks were chased into their embassy by a mob and forced to evacuate the country. In reaction, the Argentine embassy, which at the time was controlled by the right-wing government of Mauricio Macri, issued a statement saying that security of the press could not be assured in Bolivia and issued a warning against journalists traveling there. November 15th. In the morning, the government passes another decree, this one greatly increasing the military budget and military salaries, almost like they're being given special privileges or something. Later that day, the Anya's government sends the army, headed by her newly appointed high command, and with their new higher salaries, higher budget, and immunity from criminal charges, in against indigenous protesters in Cochabamba. They quickly open fire, killing at least nine, and wounding 115. The government immediately looks for scapegoats. Apart from branding the protesters as terrorists, a favorite tactic of dictatorships, they start rounding up random foreigners and claiming that they're behind the protests. One of them is the Argentine photographer Facundo Morales Schoenfeld, a former member of the FARC guerrilla group in Colombia. Schoenfeld participated in the peace process there two years ago before returning to live in Argentina. FARC is today a legal political party which holds legislative seats. Nonetheless, his former membership in the group and his presence in the country made him a very convenient scapegoat for the new government. He had arrived originally in October to document the protest for the magazine Centenario, but suddenly fell ill and was admitted to hospital on November 11th, where he was diagnosed with kidney problems. Days later, police showed up in his hospital room and arrested him. Government ministers told the media that his presence in the country was proof that the protests were the work of foreign terrorists, and they swore that there were many more of them. Curiously, after for more than a month, there's still nothing backing up that assertion. And Schoenfeld is still being held without trial in some of Bolivia's worst prisons with no adequate medical attention. That pretty much summarizes the government's MO. Protests are not legitimate, rather they're all caused by evil foreign infiltrators. And anyone who participates in them is a terrorist whose murder is justified. Case in point. They also rounded up eight random Venezuelan migrants, paraded them before the media and claimed that they were agents sent by the Venezuelan government and implied that they had something to do with causing the protests. You know, the ones in which the government had just sent in the military to massacre people with legal impunity. Since then, the Inter-American Human Rights Commission has gone to Bolivia to investigate the massacre. They found that the protesters were surrounded by military and police. When they tried to pass through, security forces told them to wait because the Bolivian Defender of the People, a special state human rights organism, was coming to mediate. But just a few seconds later, without warning, they opened fire on the surrounded protesters with every weapon they had. Oh, and also, President Añez gave an interview in which she said that Bolivia shouldn't be a secular state and that she wants to arrest Eva Morales. All in all, a very eventful Friday. November 16th. The Inter-American Human Rights Commission condemns the deployment of the military against protesters, the massacre of the previous day, and the impunity decree that had been passed beforehand. November 17th. The interim government announces that it will create a special prosecutor's team to arrest elected representatives of the opposition who, I quote, do subversion. That is an unelected government announcing that it will be taking special measures to arrest opposition legislators on trumped up charges five days after taking power. Note that branding people as subversives as a means of dehumanization to justify human rights violations against them is straight out of the regional dictatorship playbook. It was a favorite tactic of the military dictatorships of the 70s and 80s. November 18th. The government passes another decree increasing the military budget, this time allocating $5 million more to purchase equipment to help curb protests. November 19th. At least 10 indigenous protesters are killed by the army and the police in Senkata, a city near La Paz. They were protesting near the local refinery, a location chosen for its symbolic importance because natural resources were nationalized under Evo Morales and they're a huge part of Bolivia's economy. When they attempted to breach the perimeter fence, security forces opened fire. The Inter-American Human Rights Commission found that nine of the victims were killed by gunfire, that some of the victims were just passing by and weren't even participating in the protests, and that witnesses state that the death toll is much higher than what the government admits to. Many witnesses saw the security forces taking the bodies of victims away, including one of a 12-year-old girl, and have yet to reveal where the bodies were taken or count them on the official list of victims. The government went into overdrive to excuse this massacre. They constructed this narrative where the protesters were actually terrorists who wanted to blow the fuel plant up. 
and so the armed forces were apparently forced to kill them. In the same breath that they tried to justify it though, they also paradoxically claim that the security forces did not even fire one single bullet, when nine of them have been confirmed to have been killed by bullet wounds. Also on the 19th, they started replacing the executives of state companies with loyalists, starting with the head of the state oil company, YPFB. Definitely a very normal thing for a transition government to do. They also announced their plan to charge Evo Morales with sedition and terrorism, citing his words in interviews and posts on social media, as well as producing an audio recording of dubious authenticity that they claim proves that he's directing the protests. There's many reasons to doubt this recording, not in the least because it came straight from the government themselves, which had by this point already completely destroyed whatever credibility they might have once had. Regardless, even if we accept the dubious claim that Evo Morales is involved somehow, that wouldn't remotely justify the massacre of protesters nor would it make them terrorists. In fact, I would say that the terrorists are the people who are massacring them. November 24th. Anya's calls new elections, but declines to give them a specific date. She bans Evo Morales and his former vice president from running. The first isn't really surprising at all, but the second is, because the former vice president is legally allowed to run for president. They're clearly just banning a popular opposition leader because they don't want them to be allowed to run. At the time of recording, she has still yet to set a date for these supposed new elections. November 25th. La Jornada reports that at least four members of the opposition have been illegally detained. November 30th. A delegation of human rights lawyers and activists from Argentina arrives in Bolivia to take testimonies from victims of human rights violations and their families. They are immediately publicly threatened by the interior minister. Recomendamos aquellos extranjeros que están llegando al país, hechos a las masas palomitas, a tratar de incendiar el país, que anden con cuidado. Los estamos mirando, los estamos, los estamos siguiendo, estamos viendo lo que están haciendo. Government supporters take this as an invitation to threaten and intimidate the delegation, who were harassed and impeded for the entire duration of their visit. December 3rd. Four days later, the government continues its campaign of using foreigners as a scapegoat. It parades a new elite military unit, clad in black and heavily armed, before the media. They say that this force, which looks suspiciously like the classic Latin American death squad, was set up specifically to target foreigners engaging in terrorism, which I think by this point has been established to mean anyone who opposes them or critiques them. Also on this day, the popular political cartoonist Al Azhar simply prints a white square in his usual spot in the newspaper La Razón. He announces that he will no longer publish his cartoons due to a barrage of death threats, as well as the constant government attack on freedom of the press and freedom of expression. December 6th, continuing with the whole all of our opponents are terrorists thing, the government announces that they're going to ask Israel for help in their fight against terrorism, which they say is caused by Nicolas Maduro funding and organizing protests in the region, of course without producing any evidence. Note that there's still been absolutely nothing even remotely resembling terrorism up to this point, so the clear implication here is that the people protesting against the government are the terrorists. December 8th. The government offers the families of murdered protesters $7,000 each, but only on the condition that they sign a document promising not to denounce the murders before any international organizations. So the government is clearly trying to buy their way out of responsibility for their crimes, and for a frankly insulting amount too. Of course, no families accept the offer. December 10th. The Inter-American Human Rights Commission releases a damning report based on their visit to the country a few weeks earlier. Aside from strongly denouncing the grave human rights violations, they note a climate of silencing of the press, where journalists who go against the government line have been threatened into silence. They even note that the government has started blocking the TV signals of the channels Telesur and RT for reporting on information the government suppresses. They also note that given the lack of press freedom, some journalists have instead taken to using social media to report in the government's actions. Those journalists have received massive amounts of death threats for doing so, driving them away. And that makes sense because they also report that social media has been flooded with fake pro-government accounts. For example, 68,000 of them popped up on Twitter in just the first week after Evo Morales resigned. Who knows how many more have been created since. December 12th. The government announces that it wants to privatize state companies in order to make private business the 
protagonist of the Bolivian economy. This is very significant because most of those state companies were nationalized under Evo Morales. And this unelected transitional government has made clear their intention to reverse all of that with absolutely no mandate to do so. On the same day, opposition congresswoman Alicia Canqui Condori noted that opposition legislators are being threatened every day for merely performing their day-to-day -day duties. December 15th. Remember that proposed arrest warrant against Evo Morales? Well, at this point it was still being processed and Añez was getting impatient. So she publicly demanded that prosecutors put out a warrant immediately for his arrest, putting a ton of pressure on them to do what she wants. December 17th. A journalist and two artists are arrested and charged with sedition. The artists simply for making posters denouncing the Senkata massacre and the journalists for interviewing them. So in Bolivia, it's now illegal not only to criticize the government, but also to merely even report on that criticism. December 18th. The Organization of American States, which up until this point had been so friendly with the interim government that it was practically endorsing it, finally voted to pass the resolution condemning it. The government also finally succeeded in pressuring prosecutors who put out a warrant for Evo Morales on charges of sedition, terrorism, and funding terrorism. Very normal things to decide to charge a former president with. You'd think they might have gone for something that was at least plausible, like corruption or something, but I guess not. Instead, the same government that's massacred dozens of people in just a few weeks goes straight to terrorism. That's not even mentioning how sketchy it obviously is to so quickly and obsessively go after the previous president, while at the same time going after their political opposition and basically anyone who speaks out against them at all. It's like their government is based more around seeking revenge against political opponents than anything else. December 19th. The government hilariously claims that refugees are not allowed to talk about their political opinions and states that they plan to submit international complaints in a bid to have Eva Morales, who was granted asylum in Argentina, gagged. Now this should go without saying, but obviously political refugees are very much allowed to talk about and participate in politics. The entire reason that they're political refugees in the first place is because they fled political persecution. And removing their political rights would just be doing the dirty work of the regime that they fled. So as I record this video on December 19th, that's where we're at. Hey guys, so uh, while I was editing this video, more stuff has already happened. Today, which is the 20th of December, two opposition figures have been detained and one of them has had his house raided. So yeah, this stuff is moving so ridiculously fast and so many abuses are happening that more things have happened in the day that it's taken me to make this video. And probably by the time you're watching this, even more stuff has already happened and it's really just not being adequately reported on by the English language media. Bolivia has an unelected, far-right, theocratic Christian government that believes that Bolivia is governed and owned by Jesus Christ, that is very clearly in bed with the military, that's massacred scores of protesters with impunity, 36 of them at the time of recording, that's going after the political opposition, journalists and critics, and that's making drastic policy shifts that an unelected interim government should never even think about doing. All of this while openly using the rhetoric of the right-wing dictatorships of the 70s and 80s, branding opponents as terrorists, subversives, and traitors, and concocting ridiculous conspiracy theories about shady foreign agents who are apparently using mind control to make people oppose the government. You might say, well, at least the military isn't directly in charge, but I mean, they pretty much are. That's clear from all the pro-military decrees that Añez has made, and from the way that the military has so willingly cooperated with her. You can even note the collaboration visually. The military features prominently in basically everything that this government is doing. These days, it looks bad to have an actual military general in power, so why not instead use loyal civilians as figureheads? Much better strategy for them. That also gives them some leeway. Añez can easily be replaced with another civilian figurehead further down the line to make the regime look less undemocratic. There's precedent for military dictatorships having civilian presidents in the region. For example, Uruguay's dictatorship was initially headed by a civilian president who collaborated with the military. Now look, taking all of this information into account, there's some questions for us to ponder. Do you trust this government to organize and run free and fair elections? I don't. 
if they somehow did actually hold real elections, would you trust them, the military, and the new emboldened right wing that they've incited, who are already constantly threatening and attacking opponents, to accept the result if the opposition wins? I don't. Do you think it's even possible to hold anything resembling fair elections now that an unelected government has taken power and so quickly made so many drastic policy shifts and established tight control of the media while censoring, threatening, arresting and murdering their political opponents and constantly publicly declaring that their opponents are subversive, terrorist, seditious traitors? I don't. This so-called interim government of Bolivia is already dictatorial. They might hold quote unquote elections, but the actions that they've taken in just over one month in power make it very clear that they're going to be farcical at best. They're going to use every little vestige of state power that they hold to impede the opposition, stifle criticism, control the media, and put down protests to ensure that they win. Sure, the winner might not be Agnes herself, as she's already declared that she won't be running, but it'll be a continuation of the exact same thing. The winner will merely be a figurehead for this far-right, Christian extremist, anti-indigenous authoritarian regime with military backing. And even if they somehow don't win, there's absolutely no way that they'll accept the result. The question here for you personally is, are you just going to keep talking about Evo Morales and how bad you think he was while all of this is happening? Are you going to do the dictatorship's dirty work in diverting attention away as they destroy any semblance of democracy, disappear indigenous people and jail anyone who speaks out? Or are you going to be on the right side of history? Because regardless of what you think about Morales, it should be very clear to you that this is much, much worse. At least to anyone who isn't inclined to support a far-right evangelical dictatorship, and opposing them is a whole lot more urgent. And that's the end of the video, folks. Just want to let you know that I recently released a long-ish documentary style video, and it hasn't really gotten much attention, so yeah, check that out if you'd like. Now I'd just like to thank all of my patrons, and especially my $10 plus patrons. Tonga Porutu Neha, Leftist Tech Support, Key to the Fields, One Trash Boy, Industrial Robot, Malpatus, Sincione Brezgal, Mamushin, Nico of the Cestus, Violet Rain, Christoph Kaczynski, Kira B, Shantanav, Audrin and Nate Fawn, Amelia Sixis, Derek, and Jilly Bean. Bye!